Patrick Robertson. Uh, you can find me there on Twitter. I'm glad that all of you made it to the last session of the first day. It's been a long day, but thank you. Thank you for visiting me. I work at a healthcare company called Iora Health. There's four letters, three syllables. It's a little hard. What you need to know is it's a little bird native to Sri Lanka. Um, I'm in a little bit different company than a lot of you guys. Rather than um, being a technology-focused company, we actually do primary medical care. And then I'm just there to help support these people do what they do. Um, it's a fantastic thing to do. I could talk to you for 40 minutes about, about changing healthcare, but you guys are here for a technical talk. So I'm going to stop that. If you want to talk to me about it later, I'll give you all the information you need. Um, also in my spare time, I co-organize Boston Ruby. Um, the second Tuesday of every month, we have a meeting where lots of fun uh, come up to Boston and see us. Also in October, Boston's hosting its very first RubyConf. It's called Wicked Good Ruby. Uh, tomorrow is the last day uh, for early bird tickets, and I think they're just about sold out. CFP is still open. Uh, I promise Wicked Good Ruby is going to be a wicked good time. I'm not actually from Boston originally, so I don't think I can say Wicked Good um, non-ironically. So I'm just going to move on. So uh, before I get into um, helping you build better lib directories in Rails. I think I need to, to break into a little bit of philosophy. I apologize. It's the, last, it's the last session of the day, and I'm doing this to you. I'm sorry. Um, but I think uh, Ruby developers, Rails developers, kind of have this, this dual nature. I think you can, you can even look at our framework name, Ruby on Rails. Um, so we have this Rubyist, and we have this Railsist. Um, the Rubyist inside us is, is driven by love. Um, Ruby is such a beautiful language. We do what is we consider beautiful. We do what we consider elegant. And so one of the things about this is that our best practices change. Our sense of beauty, our sense of love, changes over the course of our life. It changes over the course of years. Ruby code that I wrote four years ago or eight years ago that I thought was beautiful is now probably hideous. I probably would throw it away, start over again. And you know, the result of this is that our diverse, wonderful, loving ecosystem has many solutions to the same problem. I think this is great, that we're free to pursue whatever we want, however we want it. Um, but in order to be web developers, in order to be Rails developers, we need to get things done. So Rails is driven by conventions. It's driven, you know, Rails itself is a framework where it says, this is Ruby. You have this full idea of everything that's possible in Ruby. We need to narrow it down, put you on a track, put blinders on. Now you're going to write web software. So Rails frees us from making these many tedious decisions when we're doing the request response web cycle in, in web development. Um, some of us would say we're free from all these tedious decisions. Some people would say there's a benevolent dictator that is our framework on, on making these decisions for us. Um, but you know, the important thing, the bottom line about this is that the freedom from all these decisions that we don't necessarily think are important allows us to be productive, super productive. You know. DHH talked about struts earlier today. Struts died because it was unproductive. We were able to get more done in 15 minutes than most struts developers could do in a day. So I think it's really important that these conventions and these tracks that Rails development has brought us allows us to be really, really productive. And so why do, you, why do I think this is important? Um, in the end, I think the lib directory is sort of the battlefield of your inner Rubyist and your inner Rails developer. You are basically given this tracked to do whatever you want in it. And from my nine years of, of Rails development experience doing consulting and product development, teams do end up doing whatever they want out of it. It's jumping from project to project is an interesting thing to see. Um, and so in the end of the day, I think we can, can add some conventions to how we, we think about our lib directory. Um, and I don't want to preach about object-oriented purity or architectural astronaut or anything like that. Um, the reason why I want to talk about some conventions and some, some ideas are like this, because I want us to ship more code. I want everyone to be more productive. I, I want people to be able to extract gems. I want this to happen. Um, and this is not from a, a purely abstract point of view. Um, and so there are a few conventions that I want to talk about. The first and the simplest, I'm going to go from easier to, to more meaty. The first convention that I think about is namespacing. This is, this is obvious. Um, that you should namespace anything that you're going to extract into a library. Um, partially because every application has a user library, but 
your external application may need a, a user model as well. Um, I also want to talk about avoiding the autoload trap. I want every, every piece of code in your lib directory to have an explicit entry point that's controlled and manageable so that you can extract later. I also want you to think about separating your, your configuration and the implementation details of your, of your credentials as far away from the meat of your code. Um, keeping those things meshed together is always messy. And then the last point of this is I want to isolate the interaction with your domain. I want the things that you care about in business, the reason why your Rails app exists, to be independent of delivery mechanisms, of, of other things that your users don't really care about. They just care about those things getting done. I want to keep those two areas separate when you're building library-based code. So let's do the, the first one, namespacing all the things. Um, so I think there are two reasons that are important. The first one is that collisions with your top-level namespace is sucks. Um, and so we should be free to name things somewhat similarly. So we, we put a namespace. The other reason um, is code similar to this. So in an unstructured lib directory, you often see things that are interacting with, in this case, Twitter. So we, and then we have a Twitter user, and we have a Twitter profile. All these things end up with a prefix or a postfix of Twitter. And this is, this is a problem. So this is what I consider this. Um, I call this Smurf typing. And after this slide, you may never think of it as anything else again. So every Smurf has Smurf in their name. Papa Smurf, Sleepy Smurf, Ninja Smurf, whatever. They all have Smurf in their name. It's entirely redundant. It's the same thing as Twitter user. Twitter user, Twitter profile, Twitter Smurf, you know. Um, so there's an easy, easy solution to this problem. We create a Smurf module. Then we have Papa, Sleepy, and Ninja. They're all still Smurfs. They all know what they are. They just don't have it in their name anymore. So consider that the next time you start seeing that you're in order to avoid a, a collision with your user model or your, your profile model, that you, instead of prefixing or postfixing your modules, just put it under a namespace. Simple. Uh, secondly, I would like you to avoid the autoload trap. This is probably not, doesn't quite make sense yet. But um, in the Rails 2.3 land, anything under the root directory of your application was autoloaded in memory at Rails boot. So, you didn't have to require anything anywhere as long as it was under your directory. So Rails 3 changed that. They said, this lib directory is not loaded by default. You need to do it yourself. And um, unfortunately, that broke most applications converting to Rails 3. And this was, this was years ago when we experienced it. And so everyone went on to Stack Overflow and said, how do I fix this? And so that's how you fix it. Um, it's right in the config.application. I probably wrote the answer to this thing. And now I'm telling you it's bad. It's not, it's not what we should be doing. So um, I think there's a better way. Um, the answer is the initializers directory. You can create a Ruby file in your initializers directory and then require the, the path to your lib directory. And then when you're in lib, you need to start setting up requires for all the files, all the subfolders, all the namespaces, and making this look like you're going to build a gem. Because at the end of the day, um, when you're starting this out, it takes 10 seconds. In 10 seconds, you can set up a proper requires path. When you get to 10, 20, 25 classes, you're going to screw something up. Maybe, maybe a few of you in this room would get it perfect. And converting a, a lib directory into a gem would be super easy. I've hosed it every time. It's taken me hours sometimes to sort out the, the require pass. So this is, this is just busy work that can, can get done very quickly. Um, so think about that. It's not going to be easy if you already have stuff, if you already have libraries that have, have come up and you have 15 files in them. It's, it's not easy going to be easy to go back, but think about it the next time you're setting something up. Um, next up, um, I want you to hide your credentials from your library code. Um, it's really, really easy to do something like just chucking your, your OAuth key for Twitter in, directly into your, your library code in a, a constant. This is really bad. You can't even, you can't even check that into your repository. Um, <laughs> and so the, the solution that always comes up is just use an environment variable. Do the same thing. Um, this ends up being rough if you're, you're using multiple environments. And so you have a, a, you, one Twitter application for staging. You have one for tests. You have one for development. Um, this ends up getting messy. So rather than just chucking it in like that, um, why don't we take advantage of the, the entry point? that we already uh, talked about, um, the initializer directory. 
Um, and so there's a, a pretty simple way to go about this. Um, so the idea here is I have a class mill method called configure. I pass in a config block, and then I set this uh, OAuth key instance variable. Um, the, the implementation to make this work is, is actually really simple as well. So I create a configuration class inside my Twitter Wrangler module, which is my library. Um, for this example, I'm using struct.new. Um, I inherit from struct, and so I can just pass in the, the OAuth key for that. Um, in more complex examples, you may want to actually do the full initialize, um, set all the IVARs, all that stuff. I have only so much room for code on the screen, so I, I used a cheap, dirty example. Um, the magic sauce is that we start using a class level accessor called configuration. What this does is it stores a singleton of that configuration class. And then when I call the configure method in my initializer, I'm either initializing a new configuration class or using the one that I already have, and then I'm yielding to the config block. This is really, really easy. You don't even have to think about how to do this every time. You can just copy and paste from the last time you used your lib directory. And so um, with this additional kind of boilerplate-ish class, um, we've kept a strong separation between our credentials and our actual library code. We've made it so that we can inject things in testing considerably easier. There's a lot of wins rather than just shoving a constant into your, your top level namespace. Um, I, highly, I highly consider that you do this even if you've got library code working with external credentials now. Um, and so the immediate thing I want to talk about is, is focusing, working to focus your, your web application on the, the problem domain. So in my case, I build electronic medical record software. So I want to be very focused on my patient. The patient is the center of my universe. So anything that's not about the patient is of lesser interest to me. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to go over an imaginary case study of, uh, of a feature that my product manager wants me to decide. So my project manager hit a, uh, hit a new story on Pivotal Tracker. It was as a user, or as a patient, in order to, to better lose weight, whenever my BMI is updated, I would like you to tweet my BMI out to my Twitter followers <laughs> so that I may be shamed into losing weight. Um, needless to say, this is a terrible, terrible feature. Um, exposing patient health information out to, to users is, uh, is actually finable at about $20,000 per patient, so please don't go out and build this. Shame might be a very powerful motivator, but not, not at $20,000 per patient. Um, so we're going to step through, through building this. And so if I were to pick this story off, I would, I would probably think ahead because I like to be a clever engineer and I go, well, if we're going to tweet about BMI, we can tweet about other things. So I kind of want to build a platform for which whenever a patient update happens or something like that, I may want to tweet about it. So um, there might be some, some concerns in my patient world. I'm talking about those in dark blue. So I might want to tweet about my BMI. I might want to tweet about my upcoming appointments. I may want to tweet about when I have a prescription filled for Viagra. Who knows? Whatever we want to do. Um, but then there are also some other concerns. I've got to start tweeting. So I've got to be authenticated and authorized with Twitter. I've got to handle queuing in case Twitter goes down. That tweet still needs to be sent at some point in time. The user doesn't really care about this. They don't care about you know, timeout and responses from Twitter or caching requests from the Twitter API so that we don't bombard the Twitter API or the Twitter API doesn't bombard us. So there are some concerns in here that are really important to my, my business. There's some that are kind of details that we can kind of shove aside. And so what I want to do is actually draw a line right down the middle. So some of the stuff I really care about, my body mass index that I've been tweeting, the other stuff, like working with the Twitter API, the patient's not very concerned. So what I'm suggesting, what I advocate in this situation, is using a, an architectural pattern called DCI, which is called is short, or is short for data context interaction. Um, DCI is, is a, a pattern in the large similar to MVC. It was actually developed by the same person that came up with MVC. And um, it's a good way to separate things that are important to your business from things that aren't. And so the implementation of DCI is in three parts. And so we're going to go through how we're going to do it, and we're going to also go through how we're going to test it um, spot by spot. So the first part is the role. I wish DCI was actually DC and I in the implementation instead of RCG or 
however I'm going to use it. Um, so the first part is, is the role. The role is going to be a, a mixing. It's, it's essentially behavior that I want to add onto a dumb data object. So my models in this case are just things that store data. And then I want to give them a nice hug with business logic. Um, so that's what this, this role is. This role is just giving my, my patient model a nice little hug. And so um, to implement my, my Twitter logic, I create a method called Twitter message. And then I'm, I'm working with three, three uh, pieces of data, my body mass index, the percent towards my goal, and my actual goal. Um, this is pretty straightforward. This is what your, your average kind of role will be. It may have multiple methods. But the idea is you're just adding your business logic on in, in some sort of mix-in. Um, so in order to, to talk to you about testing, um, first I need to, to break down um, a little bit on test doubles. Because as you can see, I can't really effectively test this class without whatever is storing the data. And the idea is that I don't want to be using active record models for this. I don't want to actually hit the database. It's, it's irrelevant. I just need data. So we're going to talk a little bit about test doubles first. So there are three options that I heavily consider. The first is writing a whole fake class. So I basically just need a, a fake patient model that quacks exactly like the, my normal patient model. It doesn't have to hit the database. It's right there. So bam, body mass index, 27. This is super fast. You just push it somewhere that you want it. Um, option two. Option two is actually my favorite. So in line with your tests, you can create an open struct. Um, open struct is a, a class somewhat similar to struct where you pass in a, a key value. And then whenever you um, do, in this case, if I did patient.bodymassindex, I would receive 27 back. If I did patient.foo, I would receive nil back. So it's an object that behaves um, in the same manner with whatever keys you pass in. It responds with the value. If you pass in something that it doesn't expect, it behaves. It doesn't blow up. It doesn't doesn't hit you, it just returns nil. Um, so open struct is a really effective test double as well. And then option three is just mock. These two implementations are, are very simple. So similar, instead of open struct, I just use mock. Um, I think the, the drawback in, in using mock objects in this case is that if I'm writing a test and I don't actually hit a percent of body mass index goal, for example, in one test, the mock object's going to complain that I didn't call this method. It's going to blow up the test. Whereas in open struct, it's not going to do that. Maybe the fact that you're not hitting all three of those values you don't need it in the mock is kind of a smell for your test, but sometimes I just like to get things done. Um, and so now we can step into the actual implementation of the test. Um, so in this case, I used the fake patient, because again, I don't have so many lines. <laughs> um, I would probably use the open struct under most cases. So I initialize my fake patient. I do the, the magic of DCI. I extend the patient with my tweeting patient role. And then I assert that the, the tweet is what I, I would like it to be. Um, really simple. I don't have to hit the database. I don't have to do anything that's time consuming. And I've effectively tested this, this mix-in. Um, and so the next, next portion of this is context. It's actually part of the, the DCI acronym. So I'm, I'm pleased that I at least get to do it once. Um, so this is a class that does the business. So you, you describe what you want to do in, in terms of your business logic. And this is the class that's actually making it happen. Um, so again, I've, I've become very fond of inheriting from struct. Um, so the idea here is that we have a class where we pass in um, a dumb data model, the patient model. I then uh, hit this patient tweeting method, which is uh, a cache private method of doing patient.extend tweeting patient. Um, and then. I push this onto the queue. Um, so there's differences in how sometimes contexts are used. Some people will choose to have the call be a class level method and then passing in the patient. Um, in this case, I get the advantage of if I pass it in on initialize, then I can have private methods. So if you want to, if your context needs to be a little bit more complex than this, private methods are nice. I like to hide things that I can. In class level methods, you can't do that. So I prefer to have this, this call. Um, if you're going to do something complicated like extend two roles, you know, get crazy with DCI, you can have two roles extended. You might have to do the full initialize block and pass around instance variables and all that jazz. Um, but this is, this is really simple. It's, it's pretty easy to see you know, where we're extending our role and what we're doing with our business. So we're, we're pushing stuff onto the Twitter queue. Um, testing this is a little bit more complicated than the role, but um, I still think it ends up working out really well. 
um, because I own all the other classes, I'm pretty free to mock or stub at will um, because I already know that they work. Um, so in this case, I take a patient, it's just a mock object. I don't really care what methods sit on the patient. I'm not actually testing that. I've already tested that in my role test. Um, I'm, all, I'm creating my, my context, passing in that, that mock object, and then I'm stubbing the, the queue push method. I don't actually want to test right here whether the queue is actually successful in doing what it needs to do. Um, I just care that the method's called. And then my two tests are, first, I'm testing that I've extended the role properly, and then secondly, that I've called the method appropriately. Um, very straightforward, very simple tests. Um, I think, as with anything in DCI, having an integration test around to make sure that this goes end to end is, is helpful. But the unit tests are super simple, super fast. Um, and so now we have to glue this into our application. So I've showed you how business happens. I just need to show you where. Um, so this is actually pretty straightforward as well. Uh, so um, I'm going to do this in a controller action. So my BMI controller is a um, nested controller under a patient. Ooh, I don't have red things on this. Uh, fun times. Um, so I, I find my patient based upon patient ID. Um, one of the fun things I was talking about a lot of times is people don't often do this. So finding my patients from the current user scoped, um, that's actually a really important thing to do in Rails. Rather than doing patient.find patient ID, um, you end up you end up having people that will troll your, your um, actions and just increment the IDs and, and find all sorts of fun information. You want to make sure that this, this current user has the ability to do that. Sorry for that little divergence. but um, So I find the current patient. I create a BMI under, the, under that action. And then I enqueue uh, in uh, a rescue job. So um, if I'm working with something like Twitter, I don't really want this to be on the request response cycle. I want to get this off of my, my normally fast response. If Twitter takes 16 seconds to actually send the tweet, someone's sitting around for 16 seconds and is really mad at me all of a sudden. Um, and so, you know, pretty straightforward. We're, we're doing all right so far. And then uh, next thing we do is the rescue job. The rescue job is crazy simple. All I have to do is is take the patient in and then, and then call this BMI Twitter update. It's, it's so clean. It's so nice. You know, we don't, we don't have to worry about um, a lot of things in this sort of implementation. So there are, there are a lot of wins. Um, because this Twitter update is something that only happens, it only happens in this one controller. So my patient is, is used in so much of the application. It's maybe 50% of the application is about the patient. I'm only tweeting this very one little bit when I, when I create a new BMI. And so if I had added that functionality onto it that said, I need this Twitter message, this method's sitting on my model unused probably 80 or 90% of the time when I'm doing requests in Rails. You know, the fact that there is a Twitter queue and the model would have to be somewhat aware of it is, again, something that's not used 80 or 90% of the time. So I've, I've done a very good job of isolating something that I do some of the time. Um, so as I found, like we've, we at IORL have used this DCI method um, pretty heavily. Um, I think we adopted it a little too ambitiously. So DCI, we found, is really good for things where we're creating, we're updating, or we're destroying models, or we're adding something onto a worker queue. Um, where it doesn't work super well is show and index actions, where I'm just presenting data. So in these create, these updates, and these destroy views, we're not actually, so even though this thing says, Sorry, I'm going to continue to hop this respond with BMI. Rails actually doesn't respond with an object in, in create and update and destroy actions. It actually sends back no object and says, I did it. It's cool. Uh, move on. And so D DCI works really well on this, where we just want to say, cool, we're done. And it does things in the background. Um, where it doesn't work well, show an index views. It's because you're presenting an object. There are other patterns that are considerably better for presenting data, um, decorators, the presenter pattern itself, all sorts of other things. So I think there are, there are some clear wins here and there with it. Um, I think it works best for library code because it's, it's clear. You're working with something external. I'm working with Twitter. This isn't something that I'm normally concerned about in my application. Um, sweet. So I want to recap stuff. Um, it wouldn't be a presentation 
to me without a GIF. I just love that one. It reminds me of kitten mittens. Um, <laughs> so the, the first concept is I think you should, you should treat your lib directory with a little bit more respect than just dumping random, than making it a, a junk drawer. Um, so at any time when you're working on something in your lib directory, you should be able to extract it into a gem. You should be ready to do that. If you, you build with that in mind, um, which is pretty simple, um, you'll, you'll be able to you know, not only extract because you need to use this code somewhere else, but extract it because it's getting in the way. Like your, your Rails app has become larger all of a sudden and you need to focus on, on what's really important about your business. And so you can extract this stuff out to another repository. So treating your lib directory with a, like a temple, treating it in an organized fashion is, is very, very important. Um, secondly, I think configuration, avoiding configuration nightmares is good. You, you really want to keep your credentials as far away from the actual meat of your code. You want to be able to inject fake credentials in whenever you need it. You want to be able to inject credentials on the fly when, when stuff goes wrong. Um, and then finally, I think you, you really want to protect domain interactions. Um, you know, I think if I asked you to raise your hand on if you had a, a giant Rails app and then you were responsible for breaking it down, a lot of you would, would put up your hands. It happens. Rails apps get big and they get unwieldy very fast. And so what you do in that situation is you start breaking down like what's really important, what's not. The lib code ends up being not really important. It's working with Dropbox, it's working with Twitter, it's working with GitHub, it's working with all these other things. These things aren't necessarily important. And so I am done. <laughs>